So how often have you heard someone say, I'm good at math, or I'd like to be good at math? But how often have you ever heard someone say, I'd like to be self-actualized, as Maslow would suggest, or I'd like to be interdependent, as Stephen Covey would say, or even self-authored, as Robert Keegan would say? Probably not very often. I started teaching engineering at a pretty good little engineering school just down the street from here almost four decades ago. And I came in as the typical engineering professor. I taught engineering just as I had had it taught to me. Go into the classroom, lay down the equations, have the students go home and, and, and work out their lessons, come back and repeat it the next day for the next section. Well, this went on for several years, I mean, the system looked something like this for me. Can you see what's on the right side there? Well, let me bring it up a little more. It's the student development. I was teaching the STEM, and I was teaching at heart. I knew student development existed, but that was somewhere else on campus. That was someone else's business. It certainly couldn't be integrated into my work in engineering. Well, after a few years, I realized I wanted to improve things. I asked for a sabbatical. I was granted a sabbatical. I went off to Minneapolis, worked for a really great company in Minneapolis, got in a really good team, and the company worked four-day weeks. So on Fridays, I had a chance to go around Minneapolis, visit with other people I knew, get into some other companies, and talk to the companies in Minneapolis that hired engineers, typically out of the University of Minnesota, but hiring engineers, and I asked these people, what are you looking for in the young graduate? Well, they all pretty well agreed, yeah, we want technical competence. But they said there's more. We want graduates who can talk to each other. We want graduates who can go out and talk to the people in the shop. We want people who can be part of the community. One of the ladies I met with I wasn't even sure she was going to talk to me. She was upset with engineers. They were a bunch of arrogant jerks. And that hit me pretty hard. So as, as I continued through the work on the sabbatical, thought about that, came back home, and looked at what I could do with engineering, and I started dealing with project-based learning. Got pretty heavy into it in the classroom, got involved with some projects, and realized that what I was dealing with, what these people were talking about, and in today's terminology, is this. It's not STEM, it's STEAM with student development, or it's STEAMed. All right, so I went on with this for a few years, but had a chance in, in the mid-90s to work with a group of faculty to, to start a center for teaming and leadership. A center that would address these issues that we were all starting to see it. We all wanted to deal with these issues. And so we started this center, not unlike athletics, a center where teams were formed for intercollegiate competitions, high-end intercollegiate competition, regional, national, international competitions. The Baja SAE, we hosted this competition here in Rapid City one year in 2007. The Formula SAE, human-powered vehicle, Super mileage. Take note of this. This picture was just from a couple weeks ago. And it'll be important, this team actually won an artistic award a few years ago, the visual appeal of, of their machine. Art does enter in. Robotics and several more. So we went on with this, got it started, proceeded, Four or five years into it, we were looking at this and saying, you know, our teams really aren't doing that well yet. What's going on? Maybe we made a misstep. Maybe, maybe we aren't good enough to really be in these. After all, we're going up against the best engineering schools in the world. One day at coffee, I met Jim McReynolds. He was our psychology professor. We were talking about this, and he said, Dan, you're looking at this from your side, from the technical side, and maybe that only said, why don't you think about what you could do with the human side? Go out and 
bring back to me something of, of your thoughts on the human side. I'm an engineer. I'm not a psychologist. So I go off and I, I look at what other people are doing. Codes of cooperation were being talked about. I put one together, brought it back in the next day for copy and showed it to Jim and he said, yeah, you're, you're sort of getting there. He crumpled it up and he threw it in the wastebasket. Okay? And he looked at me and said, take, take a couple minutes. I'm, I'm gonna go back to my office and I'm, I'm gonna find something and bring it back to you. This is what he came back with. Yeah, my reaction was probably just about what yours is. You have got to be kidding me. Jim, you remember, I'm an engineer. You're, you're gonna have to break me into this a little more gently. He said, not this, you, you can get this. No, let me just show you. This column is a set of values that were developed by Harold Laswell, political scientist back in the last century. And Ray Rucker took those values and looked at them for living, for, for collaboration, and we looked at them for collaboration. They make sense. Respect, affection, skill, understanding, responsibility, well-being. What Ray Rucker did is he put a scale of behavior to these values. We all talk about values as if they are here or not, as if it's black or white. Values have a scale. So with affection, for instance, we're going from the zero, that's the zero line, growing in positive, getting worse to the negative. Each one of these columns represents a level of, of that behavior for that value. Growing from the caring to the trust and wisdom onto a transcendent stage. So I said, okay, what do we do with this? He said, why don't you take this to your teams? Ask your teams what they think about this. Ask them to circle the words on here that they think pertain to their team. Well, okay, let's do it. I was pretty well convinced, after all, these are good kids, everything was gonna come out over here, we could be done with this, I could get back to working on the engineering and improve it from the engineering side. Well, as you might be guessing, that's not what happened. This is what happened. We had more showing up on the left side than we had on the right side. This was a huge awakening. Apathy, okay, we knew there was a little bit. I mean, these are students. Alienation and hatred? You gotta be kidding me. These are good college kids, smart college kids. They got the A's in high school. They're the kids who always have got the right answer. So you got two of these kids or three of these kids or four of them on a team. Who's gonna to listen to who? My idea is the best, I'm not gonna to listen to yours. So all of this stuff was going on under, under what we saw as the technical advisors. We wanted this. This one really got me. Confusion, misunderstanding. Okay, at the beginning of the year I can accept that. Sure, getting started, it's there. We were giving this to the kids at the end of the year when when they'd gone through all of this, the misunderstanding, the confusion should be gone. It wasn't. Trust, intimacy, we're looking for that. Turns out that's a pretty high thing to ask for. Empathy and wisdom. Integrity and authenticity. And again, we talk about scale of values. We say, well, either you have integrity or you don't. Either you have authenticity or you don't. It doesn't work that way. There's a scale on this. So what did we do? Here's where the pivot happened. Here's where the real change came in. We came in and said, okay, we've got to change something. Let's change these student meetings from purely technical to a combined technical human teaming leadership discussion. We forced the discussion. The whole organization pivoted. Jim was invited in as one of the associate directors of the program. We hired a student development person full time. A huge shift took place as a result of looking at the problems. And we put the learning, we put the outcomes more in line with what we're looking at as good outcomes today. We're looking at these outcomes today of wisdom in, in culture, 
These are oftentimes international teams. There's a great benefit from being at these international competitions. Collaboration, it's the middle, the middle of it. Creativity and innovation, we hear so much about that, as if you can make it happen or not. It takes a lot of work to make that happen. Emotional intelligence, give me a break, we're engineers. And engineers have identities. Engineers are people too. And we were forgetting about that. So, and here comes another key one. Self-authorship. From Robert Keegan, this, this business of dealing with our own internal personal identity, not something totally driven from the outside. An identity where we can integrate, we can work with, we can even discover, uncover, invent our own values. Huge change. Takes a different kind of learning. Takes a different approach. I no longer can be the professor standing up giving the lecture. I have to be the caring guide, as my friend Dale Skillman refers to this, who has essentially become one of my own caring guides, a person who challenges me on, on my values and, and my thinking on it, my uncovering of it. So, student development happens or not. Self-authorship happens or not. It happens in an environment where we help it happen, where we allow it to happen, where we encourage it to happen, and where we recognize that and we give the students an explicit little nudge. We don't just leave it out there implicitly. Now don't, don't forget, I'm, I am an engineer. I'm a dyed-in-the-wool engineer. I'm a blue blazer, full engineer. But I've integrated this other thinking. Yeah, that's an equation I've played with for about 40 years and developed a numerical solution on it. It's fun. And here's another one. This started out as a set of dynamics equations one Sunday afternoon about 20 years ago. And today it's at over 200 equations and counting. I'm an engineer, but I have integrated this other stuff, just as our students have. After we started this program, this, this change in the program, we went for a few years where we could see the students doing a little better. After four or five years, they were up in the top in many of the competitions. Our team won one of the international competitions. They came back the next year and won it again. It wasn't just because of the way we were dealing with them as humans. The engineering improved. The timelines were met. The responsibility was there to get their jobs done. They were looking for the real answers. The understanding was going deeper. There was a sea change in the way we were doing business. So now a few years ago, I went off and took a, a program at James Madison University to try to figure out how do we assess this learning? I'm pretty good at giving a, a technical test and assessing technical knowledge, but I certainly wasn't very good at this. And, and Jim and the other people around us were working with us and saying, you know, this is more complex. So I took this graduate psychology program, studied Abraham Maslow, studied, studied seriously. He became one of my caring guides. I've, I've read his book so many times, this is second or third copy I've had, I've, I've destroyed it. As we were dealing with then, studying Maslow's work and studying the hierarchy, it turns out, Many of the developmentalists look at these hierarchies of, of learning, the stages of development of humans. Stephen Covey has. We, we, we read the habits, but within that is the development from the dependent person to the independent to the interdependent. Robert Keegan goes and studies the stages all the way from the selfish adolescent, which is where we start on into the, the teaming, the one, one for all and all for one. And we're trying to deal with that then in college. On to a stage of the self-authorship where the thinking is there and all the way to the wise elder stage. All of these developmentalists then have these stages. They're looking at development in, in very different ways. 
and yet the stages are there. And what we discovered is, okay, we've got the kids coming in, in that stage two, stage three, sort of the selfish adolescent, I know it all, and we get them into a stage where, okay, maybe I don't know it all, so I'm, I'm with the team, we know it all. And we, we work together, and we know it all. But what we've discovered also is that let's work with them in that stage. As Robert Keegan says, on the title of his book, In Over Our Heads, what does that mean? We're living in such a complex world, we need to have the mindset to deal with that. And if we don't get out of that selfish and out of that one for all and all for one and on into the self-author thinking for ourselves, we are in over our heads. We're trying to take our kids now from that adolescent stage through the teeming on into the self-authored mature stage. It is, it's a different kind of learning. It takes a caring guide. And I don't think friends let friends stay in that stage too. We'll let the adolescents stay there, yes, but when we're dealing with it, not so. I don't think we even let friends stay in stage three. We help them move through it. We help them move on into the self-authored, thinking for themselves. That takes the caring guide. Jim, Butch Skillman, these are my caring guides along with these guys. Covey, Maslow, Keegan, and so many more. And certainly my wife helps with this as well. She's got a challenge for me every day. And, and that, that also is the caring guide. So, thank you very much.